Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to Maastricht and welcome to this academic ceremony of Maastricht University. And this afternoon, Professor Jan Smits will deliver his inaugural speech because of the appointment in the Faculty of Law as Maastricht Hill Chair on the Internationalization of Law. And the title of his lecture is Private Law 2.0 on the role of private actors in a post-national society. Professor Smith, the floor is yours, please. Esteemed Rector Magnificus, esteemed Dean of the Faculty of Law, Dear members of the Hague Institute on the Internationalization of Law, dear students and colleagues, this inaugural lecture marks the beginning of my activities on the Maastricht Hill Chair on the Internationalization of Law. It is not the first inaugural lecture that I give. I had the pleasure of addressing a different audience earlier this year at Tilburg University, and 10 years ago, I stood at this very same place here in Maastricht. With a variation on Oscar Wilde, one is tempted to say that to leave one university may be regarded as a misfortune, but to leave a second one looks like carelessness. I am all the more delighted that you have come to listen to me, and I can reassure you that I do not plan to give a fourth inaugural. The title of this lecture, you can see it behind me, may strike you as ambitious. The term private law 2.0 seems to suggest that our present day private law is no longer fit and therefore needs to change. This suggestion is right. I will argue today that the time has come for nothing less than a change of paradigm in the way we think about private law. And not only about private law, but also about several of the other legal subdisciplines. And all I ask from you in the coming 40 minutes is to follow the argument I try to make and then tell me at the reception whether you are convinced by it or not, preferably the former, of course. As far as I am concerned, I am a fierce believer in the point I am trying to make this afternoon, and I can say now already that I will continue to make this point in the coming years with even more force than I will be able to do today. My plea consists of two consecutive steps. In the first step, I'd like to introduce you to a fictitious person. Let us call her Samantha. Samantha has three aims in life. To happily marry the person she loves, to earn money with her own company, and finally, to own a nice holiday house in a sunny country. We can infer from these desires that Samantha is not an anti-globalist. We will not find her in Toronto or Seoul protesting against the meeting of the WTO or the G20. But it is safe to say that her aims in life are not unique. In fact, these aims are shared by many other people throughout the world. These are desires about shaping one's life in the way one wants to do it, both personally and professionally. It's about getting married, about setting up a company, and about buying a house abroad. What Samantha needs to achieve these goals is law, more in particular, private law. Private law offers the framework for private action. It facilitates choice by people like Samantha, but also by people like you and me. At the same time, private law sets the limits for such choice. Now, who sets these rules for private action? Where should Samantha look for the rights and obligations that govern her life? Well, here we have, ladies and gentlemen, a prevailing paradigm. And the prevailing paradigm in private law is that we still find most of these relevant rules in Samantha's own national law. In case she would live in a civil law jurisdiction, like the Netherlands, the presumption is that these rules are laid down primarily in the civil code and in the case law of the highest court. 
If she would live in a common law jurisdiction like England, it would be presumed that it is the national case law next to statutes that primarily set her rights and obligations. Of course, I hasten to add, everyone would accept today that we also have rules coming from outside one's own country, like the rules of European law. And yet there is a gap between the formal recognition that this is the case and the way in which we look at, and the way in which we look at law, present law and teach law to students. One only needs to have a look at the Dutch textbooks, but the same is true for textbooks in other countries, to immediately recognize that there is only one really important source of private law. In civil law jurisdictions, these textbooks tend to follow the structure and the contents of the civil code. But also the Dutch Ministry of Justice, a policy is the Dutch Ministry of Security and Justice, has the formal policy to implement all European elements into the Dutch code. Um, we may not realize this, but this view I just spoke about is part of a paradigm a view underlying the theories and methodology on a particular subject. It is the paradigm of a state monopoly in setting the rights and obligations of people. This paradigm finds its origins in the Peace of Westphalia of 1648, the signing of which we see here on this uh, picture. It is the idea of a state having exclusive control over a territory and over its people state sovereignty being the fundamental ordering principle. I will now take a few minutes to confront this prevailing view with reality. Is it really true that Samantha can learn about her main rights and obligations by looking into her own national law? My reading of today's society is that she cannot. The conduct of today's citizens is even surprisingly little governed by national law. And let me mention four phenomena, perhaps well known separately, but rarely taken together. First of all, there is the rise of new centers of institutional power. Um, as is the case in any of the legal fields, private law increasingly flows from the European legislature and courts. I once calculated that today more than 15% of the provisions of the Dutch code directly derive from implemented European directives. But implementation in national law does not mean that you no longer need to look at the European directive itself. When the national judge interprets the implemented law, it should look at the aim of the directive, it should look at the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union, and it should preferably also look at how national courts in other countries have dealt with the directive. But this is not all. Talking about centers of institutional power beyond the nation state, we also have the decisions, ready for a very long time now, of human rights courts, of the WTO, the IMF, and the World Bank. And these decisions can also have an important impact on how private parties should conduct themselves, more specifically on issues of free trade, taxes, intellectual property, and protection of health. And then, I have not yet mentioned the international conventions like the CISG um, and the rise of executive agencies, in particular in the context of the European Union, that can also make decisions that are directly relevant for private parties. This is the first tendency I would like to point at. Secondly, there is an increasing amount of what my predecessor on this chair, Günther Teubner, has called private global norm production. We then refer to codes of conduct for corporate or social or environmental responsibility, to rules of standardization organizations for technical standards, such as the Codex Alimentarius, and other types of self-regulation, including in contract law, the age-old standardized general conditions. Samantha's business life is in reality much more influenced by these rules than by national law. Still a different type of voluntary law 
are the sets of soft law that in the last decades have emerged like mushrooms in autumn. The best known example of this is probably the so-called draft common frame of reference of European private law. This DCFR aims to influence the setting and interpretation of norms by the European lawmaker. And of course, I agree, most of these authoritative rules and norms would not be recognized as binding in a traditional conception of law. They do not meet the formal criterion of being enacted by the relevant authorities. But reality is that they do set the norms for specific groups of people and therefore are important in predicting the behavior of these people. As lawyers, we often like to invoke authority arguments, um, and I'd like to mention here uh, two colleagues who have pointed at this phenomenon um, in a probably much more academic way than I could ever do that. First of all, our colleague um, from Harvard Law School, Craig de Burka, um, calls this in ambitious wording, authoritative rules, norms, and policies from sites of governance beyond the nation state. And two German colleagues, Niels Janssen and Ralf Michaels, with whom we work together in our new research institute here in Maastricht, called MEPLI, calls this private law beyond the state. There are still two other reasons for the now rapidly decreasing importance of national law. Reasons that do not have to do with new types of norms, but with the changing conduct of citizens themselves. And the first thing to mention here, very well known, is that private actors are increasingly mobile. The essence of the globalization process is that citizens travel abroad, companies do business on the other side of the border, leading to a truly global interconnectedness. There is probably, we, we are here in Maastricht, um, there's probably little need to convince you of this phenomenon, but I do want to spell out that as a result, the rights and obligations of people like Samantha are also in this respect, often no longer dependent on their own national law. Buying a house in Italy prompts the need to look into Italian law, let alone that today many people buy things over the internet with all the cross-border consequences this may have. The fourth and final phenomenon I want to point at this afternoon is that it increasingly happens that people choose another law than their own. Not only people travel, also the law can travel. When Samantha is building up her company, she can make all kinds of strategic decisions motivated by what law she likes best. She can, for example, choose to incorporate her company as a limited under English law and conclude contracts with her business partners in Italy and Sweden by making German law applicable to these contracts. If Samantha is Italian and lives in Italy and would like to marry her Polish girlfriend, she can do so by concluding a same-sex marriage in Canada. It may be this marriage is not recognized in all of its aspects, or not at all, in Italy, but Samantha can marry. Earlier this year, I paid attention to this phenomenon of what I call legal tourism, and I then tried to show that this is no longer something in the margin, but an essential part of today's law. And there is no better evidence for this, I would say, than the fact that even states themselves try to promote their own law by attracting uh, foreigners. This slide is a recent brochure of the Law Society of England and Wales containing nothing less than propaganda for the English legal system just to entice foreigners to make English law the applicable law and to choose London as the place of arbitration in commercial matters. And as you can see here, there are at least four reasons why English law should be preferred ending in the slogan that English law is more flexible than many civil law systems. As you can understand, after this document um, was uh, issued uh, and seen by the German Ministry of Justice, the Germans thought, well, this is something we have to reply to, and they came out with their own brochure called Law Made in Germany, Global, um, Global Effective and kostengunstig. 
if we look inside this booklet, we see again that also here German law is being promoted as the best jurisdiction in the world. Law apparently has become a sexy product that has to be sold. Now, what should we think of these four phenomena? As I said before, they are perhaps known individually, but they are never taken together as telling us something about the future of national law. This picture shows you, shows you what is actually uh, happening. The national law is still there, and the national legislature may still have the Westphalian ambition to set the law for its citizens, but in reality, this national law is surpassed. It is replaced by activities of other institutions, and it is more and more evaded by the private actors themselves. And this means that state authority is leaking away. It's leaking away upwards to the supranational and European institutions, sideways to agencies and the law of other states, and downwards to the citizens. And yet, we continue to think of law in most cases, as primarily a national phenomenon um, with only some international aspects here and there. I have a name for this prevailing view, and this prevailing view I would call private law plus. In private law plus, the four phenomena I just described are not internali internalized, they are only seen as supplementing the existing law. And it may not surprise you, I think this is wrong. If we accept that the state no longer has a monopoly in lawmaking, and therefore we take seriously the plurality of sources I just described, we should also think through the consequences this has for our view of law. In other words, we do not need private law plus, we need a private law 2.0. And I think this requires indeed nothing less than a change of paradigm. Ladies and gentlemen, we are by now right in the heart of the research program of Hill, the Hague Institute on the Internationalization of Law, that founded this chair together with Maastricht University's Faculty of Law. At the heart of Hill's research program is the question, what is the role of national law in a global society? The answer to that question is easy when it comes to a factual description. Compared, compared to what it once was, national law has become much less important. Its role is taken over by other actors. Much more difficult is the answer to the question what we can conclude from this about the role that national law should play in a post-national society. And in the second part of this lecture, I'd like to look into this more normative question by discussing some of the consequences of the development I just described. In view of the available time, I cannot be too elaborate, but you can read more about it uh, uh, um, in the written version of the lecture that you will receive uh, from Hill within a few weeks. My starting point in this second part is a functional approach. If you want to develop a private law 2.0, a very promising research method is to look into the functions that present-day private law aims to serve and then see how these functions are perhaps better fulfilled by something else in a post-national society. So let us see how we can apply this approach to what is probably the central institution of the civil law, the civil code. What functions does such a civil code have? Historically, there are several. Unification of law is one of them. Another one is to make law state law and thereby legitimate through parliamentary control. But what interests me uh, this afternoon is yet another function of codification. And the one that I believe to be the most important in today's context. And this function is to make the law accessible and predictable. Codification, not only in private law, has always served the purpose of giving an exposition of the law. An exposition by way of an overview that is rational, systematic and comprehensive, precisely to make the law accessible, telling private actors what are their rights and obligations, thus making the law certain. This we see 
very clearly already with the inventor of the word codification itself, the English philosopher and jurist Jeremy Bentham. When in London, I always enjoy uh, visiting Bentham at University College, where we find his skeleton and head stored in a wooden cabinet dressed in his own clothes, the famous photo icon. In 1802, Bentham wrote the famous sentence you can see here, a complete digest, such is the first rule. Whatever is not in the code of laws ought not to be law. Nothing ought to be referred either to custom or to foreign law or to pretended natural law or to pretended laws of nations. What Bentham thus sought to remedy through codification was the fact that law was not accessible to everyone. In a letter to the American president, James Madison, he even uses a term that is very familiar to continental lawyers, namely the term cognoscibility in Dutch, kenbaarheid, being capable of knowing. This was what Bentham saw as the core of codification, much more than unification or the making of a state. And we see the same thing, perhaps to a somewhat lesser extent, with the French Code Civil. When in Paris, I cannot go to uh, visit Bentham, but then I enjoy visiting the tomb of Napoleon in the Dome des Invalides. And there we see around the monument um, devoted to Napoleon, uh, we see very nice ornaments devoted to the achievements of the emperor. And one of these ornaments is devoted to the Code Civil. And I hope I am a better academic than a photographer. Um, but you might expect that um, unification of law is emphasized on this ornament. But in fact, what is much more emphasized is the simplicité of the code and the fact that the law had now become intelligible pour tous. And what is more, this motive is of course still important today. When the Dutch enacted the main part of their new civil code in 1992, they did so to make the whole more consistent again, and it's also what the European Commission is after when seeking to reorganize the existing European directives in the field of private law. Now, can this function of keeping the law intelligible still be satisfied by a national or European codification in our present globalized society? I believe to have shown in the first part of my lecture that this is not the case. Law today flows from many sources, too many sources, to present them in an accessible way in a codification. So can we think of an alternative? First of all, it's important to say that um, there is one approach I do not like as an alternative. The natural reaction of states when confronted with a globalized society is often to try to regain what they lost. They can try to domesticate the new types of rules I just mentioned. A similar reaction would be to argue in favor of a European civil code or even for regulation at a global level. Telling in this respect were, I think, the first reactions when the financial crisis broke loose. There was a general feeling in that time that global regulation had to be put in place, although it was immediately clear that this was doomed to failure. In my view, these are inherited ways of thinking that are doomed to failure. Um, and what we uh, 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 should accept is that they cannot remedy the problems that have uh, come up as a result of the four phenomena I just described. Perhaps the influence of European law can still be managed in this way, but the other three aspects um, cannot be dealt with through codification. Private law in a post-national society simply needs to be designed in a different way. In the remainder of this talk, I will have a look at the three different actors that can play a role here. First, private actors, citizens and firms. Second, legislators. And finally, professors. First, private actors. Here, my starting point is a very logical one. If the national or European 
legislature, the suppliers of law, cannot provide the certainty that parties need, the solution necessarily has to come from the demand side. And this demand side consists of the end users of law, so private actors like consumers and businesses. If they have a bigger role in setting the applicable law, they can themselves create the legal certainty that they need. But how does this work? How can it be that parties can choose their own law? Is it not essential for law that it is mandatory and comes about in a democratic process? Well, here the answer, at least in large parts of private law, is a clear no. As already indicated, parties are able to choose segments from other jurisdictions already today and make these applicable to many of their relationships with other parties. And this process is likely to increase in the coming decades. In their recent book on what they call the law market, two American authors, uh, Erin O'Hara, with whom we also work together in our research group, and Larry Ripstein, they argue that people should be able to choose the law that best suits parts of their lives. For example, in the United States, incorporate their company in Delaware, uh, conclude their contracts according to the law of the state of New York, and live in California. So that would mean no longer is one governed by one law for everything that one does. And if this process continues, and I think it will, this means that the role of private actors will fundamentally change. From being subjected to one indivisible national law through a fictitious social contract, we are moving towards a situation in which citizens choose those segments of different jurisdictions that they like best. Some authors have even put this idea to extremes, claiming that also citizenship should be at the free choice of people. Practically speaking, that would mean that at the age of 18, people would be able to choose for another nationality than they had before. It is clear that this view raises, the view in general I spoke about, let's call it pro-choice, raises many questions of both a theoretical and a practical nature. And the one question I like to mention here is how private, private actors would know which options to choose from. Here they have little to expect from the national legislators who will almost invariably promote their national law and remain silent about what it is that parties can actually do. This would not be a problem for large multinational companies or very wealthy individuals. They are able to get the legal advice that they need at whatever price is asked. But this is different for citizens like Samantha, who often do not know about the very possibility of choosing another legal regime, let alone about the benefits and disadvantages of the options that exist. And let us think back for a moment of what I told you about Jeremy Bentham. His concern in the late 18th century was that the law was only accessible for a small group of people. And is it not true that you then thought, well, luckily we have now passed this stage. Today everyone knows about the law. I would say that is wrong. As a result of increasing internationalization, normal citizens like you and me are just as ignorant of the possibilities the law offers them to shape their own lives as the people that Bentham lamented. In this respect, we are back in the times of before the great codifications of the 19th century, a time in which it greatly mattered for the law what was once societal status. I like to suggest today that we do away with this inequality among people by giving much more and better information on the existing legal systems and the options that exist to choose segments of these systems. One way to do this would be to create, by private initiative, a website on which everyone can look at the available options and see the benefits and disadvantages of those options. We have such comparison sites already when it comes to buying uh, products like uh, books or computers. One can create something similar for the law. Call it Amazon law, or perhaps even better, private law 2.0.
This is an example of what such a site could look like. Of course, the idea would be that all icons are clickable, leading to the alternative ways in which to deal with these issues. It's also clear that we need to work together with IT specialists to make this more attractive, but it might be a nice idea to try to make a test version of such a website for academic purposes at uh, uh, MEPLI, our new research institute here in Maastricht. And if your reply would be that this is not something real people are interested in, I do not believe you. The lawyers among us all know what is the best-selling book in Switzerland, the Swiss Civil Code. Second, there is the role of legislators. What is their role in a post-national society? The obvious answer seems to be that legislators have to set the limits for choice. They should take care of protecting weaker parties, such as consumers and employees, by providing mandatory law from which one cannot deviate. No doubt, so it seems, this is a role for the national legisl legislator. But what is surprising is that present-day legislators are not more creative than just doing this. To them, rules are either mandatory or facilitative, with often only very little in between. As we saw, this may no longer fit the needs of parties that have become much more individualized in today's society. This could even be the main reason why people start shopping elsewhere for their law. The, th the rhetorical question is whether the national legislator should not also give its own citizens more options, thus making national law more attractive again. At the moment, legislators seem obsessed, obsessed by a quest for coherence, meaning there can be only one rule on a certain issue. They then forget, in my view, that the function of coherence is to make the law predictable, and that achieving this goal is not incompatible with giving people the freedom to choose from a set menu of options. In my view, supported by economic analysis, such options can in some cases even replace mandatory law. If an individual buys a product on the internet, she is allowed to send the product back to the seller within seven working days after delivery. Would it not be nice if the consumer also has the right to purchase the item without this right of withdrawal, but then at a lower price. It would enable her to decide for herself whether she likes to have the extra protection or simply pay less, providing citizens with an option between two different mandatory regimes. This is also, this is also easily to be put into place when products are offered through the internet. In any event, the European legislator is already moving in this direction. It has created several sets of optional law as so-called 28 European legal systems, next to the national regimes. People can decide for themselves whether they want to opt in to these sets of rules or stick to their own national law. The European company is one popular example. We now have more than 200 companies already registered as an SE, including multinationals like Bazef and Porsche, the future European private company, and the future 28 optional contract law may be other examples. I think it's a pity the national legislature does not do the same thing. Finally, professors. What is their role in dealing with post-national law? It is no secret that I am a fierce believer in international legal education. The possibility to teach in a European law school at this university is one of the reasons why I returned to Maastricht. It is a stimulating and exciting experience to participate in this unique program that attracts students from all over the European Union. But today, I did not speak about training European lawyers for an international legal career. The real question is, what are the consequences of my talk for the teaching of national law, not only of Dutch law at Dutch law faculties, but also of German law in Germany or of Finnish law in Finland? 
it is sometimes asserted that studying such a national law would not require attention for how things are elsewhere, because practice would not require this. Here I wholeheartedly disagree. Even if it were true that the only aim of studying, say, Dutch law, is to offer a specialized professional training in becoming a lawyer, something that I would deny because I believe students should learn to use the law not only as an instrument, um, but also to think about law in an intellectual way. On the picture we see the Chicago professor Marta Nussbaum, who says students have to be prepared for what she calls global citizenship. But even if this were true, and professional training is the main aim, we would do a bad job if we only teach the law of the state. If the aim of such a professional training is to teach students which rules apply in the Netherlands, so that they can advise people like Samantha, it is clear that Dutch law itself is only one aspect of this. And this may call for an ambitious change of textbooks and programs of Dutch law. To end with another rhetorical question, if universities do not take up this challenge, to provide the intellectual leadership needed here. Who will? With that, it is time to conclude. I have given you a snapshot view of what increasing denationalization means in the field of private law and what it can mean for the role of private actors, legislators and universities. It is a snapshot view only, but it does hopefully give you some idea of the type of work I will do on this chair in this academic year and in the book that re will result from this um, I will also consider other legal fields because it is clear that much of what I said also applies to many of the other traditional areas of law. Esteemed Rector Magnificus and Dean, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this inaugural lecture I'd like to thank you first of all for coming here. I appreciate this tremendously. And I'd like to mention several people in particular. First of all, these are the people that the university is for, students. It gives me great pleasure that some of you are present here today. And I look forward tremendously to exploring the consequences of denationalization of law in the course that I will teach in the coming semester in the context of the Maastricht Hill Chair and the Marble Project. You will find that in my teaching model, we search together for answers to the many questions that uh, globalization of law raises. And your contribution to this search for knowledge is just as important as mine, thus building the micro-academic community that I like so much. Then. I thank the board of Maastricht University and the Hague Institute on the Internationalization of Law for having appointed me to this visiting chair. At Hill, I thank in particular Sam Muller, David Raic and Laura Kistemaker. And I realize it is not self-evident to appoint someone of Dutch nationality, I have not chosen another one yet, uh, to this chair. And I am proud to be this year's chairholder. I have been involved in Hill's activities uh, from the start, and it's impressive to see what you have established in such a very short time. This inaugural is for the Hill chair, but it is also returned to Maastricht on the chair of European private law. And this gives me great pleasure. One sometimes needs to leave a place to realize its enormous achievements and potential. Looking at Maastricht from a distance, as I did in the last three years, I saw a faculty that is truly European, in which people work incredibly hard to achieve common goals, in which there is a sphere of conviviality, and in which strict separations among the legal fields do not exist. Anyone who is interested in such Sorry, anyone who is interested in a truly international and ambitious legal education who would like to study and work at such a faculty. And I thank my colleagues for welcoming me back. And in particular, I thank the Dean, Alt Willem Heringa, 
for his warm welcome and for his great efforts to make it possible that almost the entire TICOM team could move to Maastricht. It also gives me great pleasure to see several colleagues from Tilburg here today. I mention in particular José Sid Nicolás, with whom I worked so pleasantly together in the last three years, and Jan Franken. Jan, your academic work and your view of what the university is for have always been a true source of inspiration. Earlier this year in Tilburg, I said that my way of doing research is not to defend, but to be accused. The insight that this is a valuable way of doing research, I owe to you and to Herman Schoordijk. For this and for many other things, I am most grateful to you. And leaving Tilburg was not an easy decision to make. My new academic home in Maastricht, I regard to be the Faculty of Law as a whole. But my home, in the narrower sense of the word, is the Department of Private Law and MEPLI, the Maastricht European Private Law Institute. Upon my arrival only two months ago, I was pleasantly struck by the enthusiasm that I found with many colleagues for the establishment of this center. One of the things, I like about it, next to many more, is that people from different backgrounds participate in it, cutting through the departmental structure. This is exactly what universities, in my view, should encourage, organizing faculties in such a way that research across the various legal fields is promoted. Everyone involved in MEPLI, everyone involved in MEPLI is determined to make it a true academic community by combining high-level academic work with the daily joy of working in Maastricht. So, Jaap, Chef, Remco and Michael, Gary, Nicole, Bram, Caroline and Rudolf, Pim, Anna, Emmanuel, Evelyn, Willem, Adela and José, I am confident that together we can make a very strong team. The visual that you see on the slide behind me, on the right-hand corner, um, there you see the Maori Koru, representing new beginnings, personal growth, support, interconnectedness, and striving for excellence. The last words are, as always, <laughs> for Krista. Vorige maand vroeg een Koreaanse collega aan jou hoe het was om getrouwd te zijn met een wetenschapper. Je hoefde toen gelukkig geen antwoord te geven, want een andere collega kwam toen snel tussen beiden, saved by the bell. Vandaag kan ik wel zeggen hoe ik het ervaar om jou aan mijn zijde te hebben. Dat is voor mij het allerbelangrijkste. Ik heb gezegd. <laughs>